to start the May 15th, 2024 meeting of the Roxbury, uh, or the monthly Roxbury Board of School Directors. Um, first order of business is uh, public comment. Uh, the public comment is an opportunity for the public to uh, give input to the board. We not uh, react in real time, but we um, are listening and we do uh, take note of it. Uh, it's it's very important to our decision making, and and we try to address concerns um, to the extent we can. Also, uh, if you are uncomfortable speaking or the timing does not work, uh, you can always uh, submit any sort of questions or input to the board at um, school board at mpsbt.org. Um, so uh, with that note, do we have any public comment for starting in the room? I have a question, Jim. Is this the time that uh, prospective student candidates to the board would address the board or not? Uh, we have that on at 6.45, <laughs> so which may come quicker uh, than that if if um, that comes quickly or if, if um, public comment and consent order, sure. And also, thanks for reminding, since we're at the beginning of the meeting, we do want to add an executive session uh, to choose the the additional student rep for next year. My understanding is we're only, uh, since Alara is graduating and Miriam is staying on, thank you, Miriam, um, we are um, just adding one other. Uh, and I believe we have three uh, three candidates, and thank you everyone who stepped up, but we will get to that shortly. Um, so it doesn't look like anyone in the, the room, um, anyone online, and since some of the people I see online are either ORCA or board members. We um, huh? We have one person who's not. Um, yeah, looks like no public comment. Um, just go to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is um, where the board approves uh, a variety of kind of pro forma things that uh, do not uh, require discussion. It's really kind of a way for us to get a lot of business done quickly. Uh, things such as um, previous minutes, um, agendas, um, and the approval of contracts and hires. Um, do I have a motion to approve this meeting's consent agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second that. Any discussions or questions about the consent agenda? Fine. Yes. Um, thank you to the Roxbury Transition Committee for taking such good notes. And then the, um, the document, the public engagement and relationship map is also really helpful for people like me who couldn't be there. Um, so I appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and just thank you to the Roxbury Transition Committee in general. I know they're doing a lot of work and it's been busy and hard. So yes. thank you, everyone. Um, all in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hey. Sounded like a late oh, eye from Tim. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, all right, great. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, as I uh, alluded to before, um, Alara is graduating in about a month. Uh, How many and... days, Alara? <laughs> um, I know. I... I think like. 38 days maybe less uh, no, 29 it's less... wait a second it's 29, <laughs> 29 yeah. yeah sorry i've kind of been losing track of time <laughs> it's all good no and i i know from my own senior that um the, the days are being counted down <laughs> uh but congratulations um but as such uh um, Alara will be, I, I believe you're going to Smith next year, right? Yes, Alara will be going to Smith next year and will be stepping off of the board. Uh, congratulations again. 
Uh, so we um, and Miriam, very thankfully, will be staying with us. Um, and um, so we need to appoint a new uh, new student rep uh, to replace Alara. And my belief is we have three candidates. Um, so if any or all of you would like to speak to the we board. Do we have, can... So there's a student presentation prior to from Alara and Miriam. Oh, so that was the yeah the board. I mean, I we can we can switch Peggy. No, we can switch Peggy Sue and that around, and that's under board discussion. Okay. Um, you can do however order you want. I will. I will say just. Um, oh, Miriam is eating over there still, I, though. <laughs> yeah. Why don't Why don't we Why don't we switch it around just because we have folks here sure. and. Um, and then we can get to the special ed update and the uh, um, and Miriam's presentation. We can let her fuel up first. Uh, uh, whoever wants to to come up, we got your letters, which are all of which were great. Um, so if you want to come up and uh, introduce yourself, and the board may have a, a few questions, but um, please please feel free to do so. And uh, the chair is not as scary as it looks. Uh, but um, yeah, just please feel free to to step up and and, and say hi and uh... <laughs> why don't we go? Um... You're much nicer than I am, Amani. The chair is yours. Let's go. <laughs> I, I was gonna say go by by for. for... I feel singled out. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I am getting over a cold, sorry. Um, one of my goals, um, if I were to be given this position, um, is I I want to work towards finding more ways for all students to have reasons to come to school and to enjoy attending classes, and whether that's you know having a teacher they you know, want to go catch up with that day or having a class that they know they're looking forward to. I just would like to see a lot more students here enjoying being here. Um, I, um, I think that a strong student representative on the board um, would be connected with the community and involved in extracurricular activities and um, a good listener. Um, punctual to the meetings and open to hearing other perspectives. Um, and I think that I, I bring those qualities and I contribute um, in an effective and helpful way. And I would be honored to be selected. Um, and I understand that this is definitely a time commitment. Um, and I have, you know, heard from other people what it could be like. And I, I'm excited. And I think that um, I really... Um, enjoy what the board has discussed in the past, and um, I appreciate the hard work they do to keep this community running. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, questions for Amani? I think I think we put it in the description. I yeah. was going to ask also, but then that would sound like we're quizzing you on the. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions for Amani, or can we yeah. can we let her off the stand? Great. Um, who first. wants? Yes. Thank you for going first, uh, or thank you for being volunteered to go first. <laughs> uh, who uh, Who do we have next? Um, Sam, or Sam. Sam or Jacob? Sam's ready. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Sam Boyce, um, and I'm a sophomore here at Montpelier High School. I'm a bit nervous, but please stay with me. Um, I'm here today because, as you know, I want to be considered for the open seat, student seat at the school board. And I'm very excited to be considered for this seat 
because it offers me a way to make real changes here at the high school and really all over the district. Um, I, I want to... <sighs> I want this experience because of what it will mean for me to experience what it's like to be here in a more professional setting and get more used to it, even though this is a more calming, not calming, chill experience than other professional places. Um, but it'll still give me an opportunity to be a part of that and to learn. Um, I do also know that it's a time commitment. I read all the, basically the whole doc. Uh, thank you for listening and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Sam. Any questions for Sam? Sounds like you know about the time commitment as well. Sam, you said you're a sophomore. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Any, no. Yeah, no, thank you, Sam. Um, and Jacob? Uh, hi, my name is Jacob Kaufman Elship. Like, you probably know that. I am really excited that I was considered for this position. Like everyone else, I am aware of the time commitment. I'm a freshman here and I think I'm interested in this because I am interested in going into education and I'm just curious about what goes on like behind the scenes, how decisions are made for the school district. And I also just think it's interesting. I do two extracurriculars here and one through the rec center, Taekwondo, like what was in my letter. And I think that it would be beneficial for me in the future, especially if I do want to go into education, to know what goes on behind the scenes and how decisions are made. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, questions for Jacob. How long is the term that there? It's generally been a year. One year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a big Yes, I think we decided to try to get. Uh, Two years with a yeah, continuity overlaps. A little overlap, mm -hmm. if possible. Peer mentorship. Yes. Fun. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, if you guys are you are very welcome to stick around uh, and watch the meeting. Uh, otherwise. If you want to uh, recapture your night, um, it won't be held against you. It won't be held against. <laughs> it won't be held against you, and we will uh, let let you know uh, after the meeting's over. So we'll we'll have to go into executive, executive session, session yeah. at the end of this meeting, yeah. make the decision, then um, and then I guess I can email folks if email works afterwards. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So now we're on to the actual student presentation. Let's see, Marin is still. I think Laura's got the lead. I, know I, can, I can present. Great. Okay, this, oh, this is our student presentation. Um, we just have some updates with what's happening at school this month. On the next slide, there are some pictures. Um, on May 25th, um, the sixth annual race and rally against racism is gonna be held at the State House Lawn. It's a student organized and run event to raise funds for an organization that works in social justice. Um, and there are gonna be student performers and speakers as well as student run workshops, but also workshops from um, like tables with uh, community members. Um, last Friday, um, 
for the third year in a row, the acting class went to UES and we performed some children's theater for them. And it was a really cool experience because I actually got to write and direct the show that we put on as well as be in it. Um, and it's just, I've a lot, it was really heartwarming to like have a lot of the kids come up and be like, this is my favorite day of the year and it's a great show and it's just a great way to be involved with the community and introduce theater at a young age, which is so important. Um, and then also over the weekend, um, there was the Allstate Music Festival and those are some students and faculty members there. Um, and then on the next slide, um, this Friday, we're having our pizza for the people event which is an all-school event where we typically go outside we eat pizza and we have student performers and there are club tables and kids can learn about what's going on with clubs next year and <clears throat> it's uh, one of those special fun mhs community events um the rally for the planet is on may 23rd and as well as the MHS Pops concert with chorus, orchestra, and band performing some popular songs. Um, and then we have been working on some AP exams for the past two weeks and spring sports are still going strong. There have been a lot of wins over the last few weeks. And then on our next slide, um, Miriam and I held our first school board advisory group meeting where we invited student representatives from um, social justice clubs and affinity spaces to um, give us their thoughts and feedback on how the board can support them. Um, uh, there was, they all agreed that like, yeah, that we, <laughs> we need some support even if they couldn't think of an example at the moment, um, we plan on holding regular meetings, so we'll have more feedback. Um, Club Action suggested continuing to improve curriculums and educate students on social justice and issues of race. And um, The Conversation, which is our club that works on dismantling rape culture within the school, suggested providing an anonymous helpline within the school for students because a lot of um, organizations have anonymous helplines or just a way to anonymously ask for help or report an incident, um, but we don't have that within the school, which would, um, the representative felt like having that would give uh, students an opportunity to speak out more. And then, um, as well as receiving help and funding their future consent workshops, um, we, the senior class does a consent workshop with a speaker from New York, um, and the conversation on their own raised, I think it was about $4,000 through like bake sales and donations, but it was really hard. And they said that it might not be feasible to do it year after year. Um, but it's basically a workshop that prepares um, seniors to um, relearn or our consent lessons that we learned as freshmen, now as seniors before we go to college and how we can apply that moving forward. And yeah, those are our updates. Awesome. Um, anything to add, Miriam, or any other questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was drowning in AP exams and so was Alara, and somehow she was the one who pulled this off. So I appreciate you for no, this, I Alara. I definitely know the exam time. You are uh, welcome to say I'm drowning in API a, <laughs> or a, the yeah. exams and I don't want to do a presentation in the future just for you. Yeah. That was great, Laura. Thank yeah. you. Questions? Who's performing um, at the Race Against Racism? Is there a band? Um... Uh... Jacob knows. Um, yeah, okay. Student performers. I don't remember who exactly, but there is one. There's a couple like adult speaking, like ATBT, uh -huh. who played last year at Flanagan. 
I know uh, our president of production is Sam. Is Dia playing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Beta is doing speech. And I think there's a few other people. In this stuff. Nice. Awesome. I have a question for Laura. Um, on the the conversation group um, had the helpline idea, and I'm wondering um, how do you envision that? Like, who what who would be answering the helpline, and what medium would it be? Like phone, email, or something else? Yeah, I don't necessarily think like it's an actual like phone helpline. Um, I think. I can't really speak for the conversation, so it would be, I think, more productive if in our second meeting we asked them what that would look like. But for me as a student, I think either like an email or like a Google form would work that like doesn't um, or like a Google form that doesn't record your email, just something I know that also like talking can be really like um anxiety inducing for a lot of students like talking about those issues so those are just my ideas but i would like to speak to the conversation again about that idea but Thanks. also i was like i don't know i guess i have a question too because i know that like educators are mandated reporters so would there be some like legal thing about keeping that like resource anonymous where I don't know that's just what I thought of at first Laura that's really perceptive we have a reporting form under HHB on our website which that just tells me that we need to publicize that a little bit more um, and tie it to the sexual nature that the conversation is talking about because that's not HHB necessarily um, so that's just good information for us to know that students didn't know that that was on our website. Um, as far as the anonymous piece, if it's anonymous, we can't report anything because we don't have a person to attach it to. So kids really shouldn't be worried about that. But you're right in the mandated reporter piece that if we do know, we do need to report that. Other questions for Alara Miriam? No, thanks again for the great presentation. Um, yeah, these are super helpful and really appreciate the work, especially when you have a lot going on to wrap up the year, including AP and other exams. Um, so now uh hear from Peggy Sue, uh special education professional learning mm -hmm. update, which uh, I think we're all very excited and interested to hear. So thank you for, for coming. Jeez. I appreciate the excitement. All right. Um well, I'm assuming that oh, are you this is in response to um just to make sure the board's really clear. This is in response to the or the special education audit that we had done last year. And what was asked of Peggy Sue from Jim and Mia was just a kind of reflection on what we've done this so far and what we're looking forward to do. So it's not data, just to keep in mind. Okay. All right. You want to switch the first slide? I have it here because I don't have my readers on. Um, Okay, so yes, this um, just some context for the information I'm going to share. Um, so last year we collaborated with the Ability Challenge to complete an assessment about the experience of students with disabilities in our district. Um, so the needs assessment, which is linked, um, looked at the district as a whole, not just at the special ed department, um, because students with disabilities are a part of all the part of our district, right? So that we should be looking at all their experiences and not just the special education part. Um, one of the things that I think is important to highlight is that traditionally um, school departments have worked in silos, but we continue to work to become more interdependent. Um, and I cannot take credit for all that is in this presentation. It is definitely the work and intentional collaboration of folks in central office, the building administrators, the faculty and staff in service to our students and their families. Um, and also, this is not an exhaustive list of everything that's happening, but just a chance to share some of the highlights. 
So um, there may be, there is lots of things happening that may not be here. And I am not the expert on everything that is here. So I may not be able to answer in-depth questions about curriculum, for example. You'll have to ask Mike in a couple of weeks if you have questions about that. Um, okay, so. Um, so the way that the Ability Challenge wrote their report is that they looked at five um, different elements of our district and they made recommendations. And so what I've done is I've copied those recommendations into this um, and then have some highlights of some of the aligned work that we're doing and some of the future planning that we have. Um, one of the things that, um, again, thinking about the interdependency is these are not elements in isolation. So there are things that might be listed, for example, under element one that are also actually working for the recommendations for other elements as well. So I try not to repeat, but there might be a little repeat, but just know that, again, it's all it all works together. So the first element that um, they looked at was the culture of collaboration and inclusion. And um, the recommendations in the report talked about developing an action plan um, that's tied to our vision for inclusion, um, working with school leaders um, and creating a culture of collaboration of, from the top. So starting with how are we really collaborating as an administrative team and then being able to uh, model that and work that with the faculty in our buildings and staff. Um, to provide training to staff about understanding and mitigating bias um, and engaging teachers in discussion about high quality collaboration um, so that we can improve our co-planning and ultimately create better learning experiences for all of our students. So some of the work that we have been doing that's ongoing, um, we have weekly collaborative team meetings at all of the schools that are looking at student data together. Um, our admin team has a problems of practice protocol that we do where um, administrators bring um, challenges they're facing, um, problems they're trying to figure out, something that they just need more input on. And there's a whole process for um, at the other administrators to listen and then provide, ask questions to get people to think deeper about it and try to help the administrator get to a place where they come up with some ideas they want to try. Um, so we've been using that protocol. Um, we are doing work in our admin teams around understanding and mitigating biases. Um, we have a weekly staff communication um, that we're sending out that's focusing on the different areas of our vision. So academics, social emotional learning, chronic absenteeism, special education, multilingual learners. Um, I believe that's now, and I get you get those in the board packets. I think um, the wing, the roots and wings. Um, and we all got to create our own little people, which was that fun to look at. Um, we, uh, Mike is taking charge and leading on our developing our new continuous improvement plan that is required um, by the state. And um, so we've been working on that um, as a district and then in the schools. Our multilingual teachers have been doing professional learning with uh, staff and faculty. Um, particularly as we welcome new families to the community to make sure that we are um, welcoming them and trying to um, work with them to understand what their needs are and um, their celebrations and um, what they can bring and what we can give them. Um, so the ML teachers have been doing some work with that. We have coaches um, that work with faculty around academics and social emotional learning. And we have had a number of faculty offer um, professional learning classes through Southern New Hampshire University this year that have been really successful. So um, looking at what expertise we have within the district and then providing people the opportunity to take classes that their colleagues are teaching. Um, and that has been something that's gone really well. Uh, looking ahead, we need to implement the CIP. Um, that's going to be an important one. Um, we are looking to do some professional learning around co-planning and co-teaching. Um, we are looking to have regular, regularly scheduled meetings between special educators, interventionists, and SEL teams to look at data and to maximize how we're using our resources. So we are doing that right now, but not as a whole team. So we're talking about next year scheduling the like UES special ed department to meet with the UES interventionists and the SEL interventionists there all at the same time so that we can really make sure that we are um, using our resources in the best way we can. 
um, looking to do more professional learning around high quality instruction and keep those classes going um, that the faculty have been facilitating. We are looking to do bias training um, with staff and faculty, and um, we have to develop what's called the allow plan, which looks at our um, learning opportunities for our multilingual learners. The last one in the district was from 2008. So um, in the next year, we have to have that drafted by the end of the year. So there's a whole process that I will be looking and maybe come here at some point and ask y'all for some input around it um, as we, we get through that draft. So there are like 10 different components that we will be looking at um, with those learners in mind specifically. All right, next, thank you. All right, the second element um, was around student-centered curriculum and instruction. And this is all Mike, so I'm gonna read you to what he wrote here, but I said, please tell me. Um, so the recommendations were around building on the priority standards um, to build out curriculum maps. Um, and aligning our priority standards with the so scope and sequence, providing educators with professional learning on um, data-driven instruction, and developing a district calendar um, to look at our data analysis cycles and make sure that they align with our common assessment schedules. So some of the work that's been happening, um, teams are creating common form of assessments and planning interventions across teams. This has been really exciting to see this year. Um, we are working on vertically aligning um, through content areas K-12. Uh, there, oh yeah, we have a cohort of professional learning. We were just there today, um, specific to math and literacy intervention. And we have special educators, tier one educators and interventionists all there, as well as administrators. Um, the local assessment plan um, is providing timely and, and actionable data. Um, across all the schools, and we are examining our practices um, as just as part of our regular um, work with curriculum. Looking ahead, we are looking to target and increase our professional learning opportunities for staff, continue with the, the instructional coaching that's happening, continue to build our PLC structures and collaborative team times across the schools, um, the guiding coalition leadership will continue to focus on student learning and success. We've seen um, really positive results with the guiding coalition and the collaborative team structures this year. Um, continuing to do that vertical alignment uh, across content areas um, and then continue to refine the proficiency skills and standard-based learning. The third element um, is the shared understanding of and practices for special education. So, the recommendations from the Ability Challenge were um, foundational training on special ed laws and mandates for the leadership team here, um, providing educator, educators with professional learning on understanding disabilities and their impact and how to um, support diverse learners in the classroom, develop clear expectations for developing quality IEP documents and provide staff training on that and engage with all staff members who support students with disabilities to understand their roles and responsibilities. Some of the work that we've done, um, the administrators engaged in a year-long workshops last school year in preparation for the changes under Act 173. This summer, we did LEA training um, for the administrators. In the fall, the special educators and speech language pathologists did a workshop with the Ability Challenge around effective IEP writing. We have targeted ongoing um, professional learning opportunities for our instructional assistants and our behavior techs. Um, we created a special education professionals handbook so that we created that last summer um, to continue to align our practices and make sure that we're doing the same things across schools. Um, in the, during in-service, we did some um, learning around what the teacher's role in special education is. Special educators have been trained about the changes under Act 173. Um, we piloted, as part of the pilot with the Panorama data system this year, we piloted whether or not it made sense to use that for special education progress monitoring. Um, we are in the process, we have a drafted an MTSS handbook for faculty and staff, and we have updated the referral process for special education evaluation to align with the updated state rules. Um, the work we have that looking ahead um, to continue working on professional learning around inclusive, high impact teaching practices. Um, the Ability Challenge gave us a tool to calibrate how we're writing IEPs. So 
looking to use that next year. Um, we need to review the data from the pilot at Panorama and decide what our next steps are for special education progress monitoring um, to increase our alignment across schools. Uh, we wanna finalize the MTSS handbook to have a fall rollout of that. And um, we are starting to look at our disproportionality data to monitor that our practices are equitable or if they're not to try to understand why. Uh, the fourth element, the equitable systems and resource management. So recommendations from the ability challenge were to develop um, district-wide expectations around schedules to make sure that we are providing opportunities for intervention, um, to clarify and update the district-wide continuum of services based on student needs, and to make sure that we are looking at allocating resources based on student need. So the work that we've done, um, the administrators engaged this year in uh, workshops with the Ability Challenge around building a understanding and building the continuum of services. Um, our school schedules have been developed to maximize how we use our human resources and ensure access to tier one for all students with designated times for intervention and tier two, which is the reteach of tier one. Um, we hired um, social emotional learning professionals with our idea B, with some of our idea B money to provide specialized instruction and functional skills based on the change in regulations. Um, special educators and interventionists are grouping students based on needs. So Act 173 allows us to um, work together on, on, in doing that. Um, special educators and instructional assistants have been assigned to buildings based on student needs. So it's not just looking at, I've always been at the high school, so therefore I'm at the high school, but it's really looking at the number of students with IEPs and where we need people to be. Um, the principals have been doing a lot of work and leading a lot of work um, in professional learning around reading um, at the elementary and secondary level. And the SEL teams in each of the schools meet weekly to review student needs and identify what resources they require. Looking ahead, again, that regular time between special educators, interventionists, and SEL teams that I mentioned already, um, we are trying to figure out a way to have designated co-planning time with general ed teachers, special educators, and ML teachers built into schedules. So right now it's happening, but it's happening in pockets based on availability. And so we're looking to um, find a way to make sure that that is built into schedules so that we allow our teachers to have the time they need. And then we will also be talking about what we're doing with that time. Um, we are continuing to build and refine our continuum of services within schools and always going to continue to build our capacity to support students with the most significant needs. And lastly, element five, meaningful family partnerships. Um, the recommendations from the Ability Challenge were to provide training to teachers and administrators about operating with empathy and cultural competence. Um, to create district expectations for family engagement and to convene family advisory committee. Um, so some of the work that uh, we've done, uh, caregivers handbook for special education was created last summer um, and is updated as needed. Uh, Mike and I did listening sessions with families of students with disabilities. Um, we have changed our structure. So case managers loop with students for at least two years so that there's stability and consistency for students and families and case managers. Um, we created a monthly progress note format um, because there are some families that were seeking information more frequently than quarterly reports. There is a district caregiver council and we continue to work on aligning our practices across the schools. Looking ahead, um, we're gonna continue to look for ways to authentically engage with families that historically have been marginalized, um, work on building our system capacity to address chronic absenteeism because Nick can't do it all, although he does it pretty well, um, align reporting measures across schools and continue to, to develop consistent systems for sharing individual student information with families. That's it. Um, questions? No, I really appreciated how comprehensive that was. Right. Yeah. Um, we've paid for a lot of audits and stuff mm -hmm. that you know, facilities thing, equity thing. Do you feel like the recommendations 
from this audit are really helping direct some some change and, and moving things in a different direction or helping that process? Yeah, I do. I think um, the timing of it was interesting because we were also, a lot of us were new to the district. And so um, and it confirmed a lot of what we were already doing anyway, which was great, but it's nice to have that. Okay, this is you know the right way. They have been great to work with this year. I think the, they've been able to provide um, some great structure for the administrators to think about special education. Um, so yes, I would say yes. And we will continue to do it, to use this. Um, and I think it fits in nicely with the equity audit, right? Because this is all part of equity. So, yeah. Panera is a great system, not for special education though. <laughs> Schedules have been improved to align tier one and tier two um, access, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is that true at the high school as well? I understand that at the high school there are some special challenges because there's so many, so many moving pieces. Yeah, what you're referring to is more tier three with the remediation piece, and it's still a challenge at the high school. We're still trying to figure that out of because a child who's a second grader has could have remediation services if they need it every day, five days a week. Right. With an expert, whereas a high school, because of the green white schedule and um, just the way the design is, the day is designed, it, it might be in the same, in the same time period as that second grader. It might be that they receive services in that way for four days, you know, not four days of the week, but four days in a three month period, you know, so it, we haven't figured that piece out. That's still a struggle. And I think it's a struggle for most high schools. What the high school has done a better job this year is using their soul in block better, um, which is more the tier two services of reteaching the prioritized standards. So there's callbacks, there's a system I'm looking at Miriam, but there's a system to get called back um, where it's not necessarily a choice for kids. Um, <laughs> she's like, no, it's not actually. <laughs> um, so they've done it. They've really focused in on that tier two um, reteach opportunity and they've done a nice job, but the, the remediation is tricky in the high school. Just as part of the same line of questioning to the kids, I see in the newsletter, there are opportunities for tutoring, but it's kind of volunteer only. Do you guys feel like is that like kids sign up for tutoring if they wish? I think that 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 ability is available to high school students. In your experience, or anyone if anyone knows, is that something um, people take advantage of? Yeah. So one of the one of the clubs at the high school club action, which we were talking about earlier, because they run the awesome race and rally against racism. They also run the peer tutoring program here, um, which I can talk about because I tutor through that program. Um, I don't know exactly how many students take advantage of that. I don't, I don't know if they collect those numbers, but I think for the most part, they try to keep it anonymous so students don't have to have other people know unless they want them to. Um, but it's a great resource. I know lots of people have taken advantage of it. Um, it is, it's purely a volunteer system and it's based on the work between the tutor and the 2T. So I don't, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, but for the most part, I think it helps a lot of students with their schoolwork. I mean, I've been tutoring people in chemistry all year and it's worked out pretty good for me. Um, the teachers who support it are great. And yeah, I think it helps a lot of people. It's good to know my son will be taking chemistry next year and may need a tutor. So <laughs> just start naming your price. So I just want to clarify something Libby said when she was talking about some of my only get services four times in three months. That's not students with IEP. Oh no, that's yes, okay. okay. That's a different so, thing. Yeah. So thank you. Typically, you. students with IEPs will their services are written that in a two week period they'll have this many days, and there are some students that we build their schedule so that they do have the service every day. So it just means that like maybe first period every day they don't take another class. So. Just want to be clear. Thank you that. for that clarification. Yeah. That is important. This report is really important for the This this 
Seems students, like there's a yeah. lot of overlap. There's, yeah. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of overlap because students with disabilities are in our classes and doing all the things. And so we want to make sure that they're accessible. So yes, the, the needs assessment looked at the experience of students with disabilities, but as we develop a system for that will make things better for everyone, that includes our students with disabilities. Uh, it's a state requirement that has, oh, I, I should have looked, I meant to look today. I think there are 10 different components, but it's really about ensuring that we are providing comprehensive education for our multilingual learners, which used to be called English language learners, but multilingual is more strength-based. This might be a question more for you, Libby. I, I feel like sometimes we we always just add things and I don't know how teachers have enough time in the day to like participate in all these really good initiatives. Do you feel like the expectations laid out here are reasonable? Do you feel like staff are excited or is this, are we like, is this- In like the LOW plan thing? thing or? No, I'm sorry, oh, just general. now of like all of the various like recommendations and implementation of this, like is there time in the- So I day? think the important thing is that it's not one more thing. It is just getting better at what we're doing. And you know, what I tried to say in Roots and Wings, now that I have the opportunity to say things frequently for people to in theory read, um, is that if we start by planning for students with disabilities and then go from there, everyone can access it because there are lots of things that um, a student with a disability may need that someone with a disability without a disability may also need. Mm -hmm. So if we can start there, then we are always going to be able to meet the needs of more students. But it, this isn't like a separate, like now you have to do this, like the more that people can collaborate with others and do that. We're using everyone's expertise as opposed to saying, teacher, go in your classroom and hear your 30 kids and figure it out all by yourself. Yes. Chronic absenteeism piece comes up a lot in these meetings. So um, about how we build system capacity to address chronic absenteeism for students with IAPs and 504s, is that addressed? Is there anything you do to address that differently based on those students' needs? So this is Nick's area of expertise, but I'll try. Um, so if we have a student with a with an IEP, right, that's missing school, we certainly, like any student, want to try to understand why. Um, and some of that is um, as simple as having an adult call to say, hey, why are you not here? You know, reaching out to the families to figure out what the barriers are for kids coming to school and then seeing what we can do to support them to, to get rid of those barriers. Um, and so students with IEPs or 504 plans have a case manager. So it's one more person that's kind of keeping track of them and seeing, you know, it's kind of on top of that, but it really is something that is across the, the school that we need to be just looking at. Like what are, what are our steps formally or informally that we're doing when kids are missing school to make sure that no one's just falling through the cracks. Um, I, and I think we definitely have um, work to continue to do, particularly at the high school around engaging students when school is really hard. Um, so we have, you know, students uh, with IEPs in high school is really hard. And so um, we do have kids that are just disengaged. And so Nick works really hard. And, you know, the other staff are also working hard to try to figure out how to to re-engage them in school. And I think that's where we look for more opportunities for flexible pathways or thinking about other ways besides sitting in a class um, to earn your high school diploma. That's great. Um I'm sure this is what well, the meetings before. Are there higher rates of absenteeism, um, chronic absenteeism in students with 504s and IEPs than the broader school population? I feel like Nick has said yes. Um, but I would... Yeah, we've studied that disproportionality yeah, data. Definitely have, yeah. And there is there's a slightly yeah. higher, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Um, is it vary between 504s and IEPs? Or... We don't break it down like that. I suppose we could, but we haven't. All right. Along the lines of um, Brett's first question, Brett, excuse me, first question. Um, in the needs assessment from last year, um, element one was the only one that we were rated as proficient, and the others were all fair. Um, yeah, I'm curious, just sort of broad stroke, how you feel. I'm, I'm, I assume that we're not going backwards on any of them. 
Um, but how do you feel just in that sort of broad, I know we're not getting into data, but the broad sort of stroke, um, proficiency, fair, emerging, that sort of thing for the for the five elements? Um, I think that we are, I would say that we are doing a lot of great work. We have a lot of really great people and we definitely are not going backwards. Um, I haven't taken the time to look at the specific scores. Um, you know, I try to spend my time either in, um, you know, broad programming or in individual kid meetings. Those are my two places that I live. Um, so um, I think we have a lot of really great things happening. Um, there's a ton of collaboration happening. Um, we've done so much work this year around reading. That's been huge. Um, and just seeing the professional, I mean, part of it is I don't have a lot also of like history, right? This is only my second year. So, um, you know, I've gotten no parent complaints this year, formal ones. Um, I know, sorry. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's a lovely data point. Um, doesn't mean there won't be one tomorrow, but, um, I feel like we have a really strong team and people are working really hard to make sure that kids are getting what they need. So, yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. You have accomplished a lot. I feel like you've been here a lot longer. That's surprising to me. Wow. Do you hear that? You've accomplished a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy Sue. You're doing fantastic. It all started because I was Libby Snelling partner. <laughs> we did a leadership program called Snelling together, and and they paired us together because we are the direct opposite um, Myers Briggs profiles. So they paired us together, and yes. and then it was like love at first sight. That's right. <laughs> she lured me here. Um, in element one, um, one of the recommendations was uh, develop a clear action plan. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned the, the what is it, continuous improvement plan. Mm -hmm. Are those, sim like how much overlap is there between this continuous improvement plan and the recommended action plan with timelines, owners, measurable goals, et cetera? So the continuous improvement plan looks at the district as a whole. And then within that, you know, some of what we're looking at with those goals is breaking down the information beyond great 75% of our students scored this to like looking at um, that disproportionality, that disproportionality data and the data like what about students with disabilities and we're looking at growth rates um, and trying to look because by definition, students on IEPs, right, have some um, something that is not on grade level. And so if we just look at grade level, then that's not really showing us if we if we are helping students grow. So we're looking at different measures to, to look at that, yeah. So is that, it's partially getting us towards the action plan? So my, so the way that I see it, there's equity is like the big, what we need to do for every student. And then under that is our CIP, is our MTSS system, which is, you know, and also I would say our MTSS, when I say system, systems in the S part, but anyway, um, that is where that action plan I feel like comes from is really looking at what is our whole system look like for intervention? And then what are we doing specifically with students with disabilities? So yeah, it's all, I think that's the the important thing is for us to continue to understand how we all fit together, that we're not separate. Like special ed is not a separate thing. It is part of a bigger system. Students with disabilities are part of all of our system. And so, yes, we need to look at them and make sure that we are providing what they need and they're making the growth Then we're setting them up for success. But we also don't want to pull them from all of the system stuff that we're doing. And then element two, um, one of the recommendations was developing a calendar for data analysis. And I know that the some of the data um, collection systems are still being piloted, but mm -hmm. are we anywhere closer on a calendar for uh, cycles for data analysis that, that are recommended? Yeah, so the I, where this work is happening is with our um, common assessments that we're doing across the district. And then 
we're looking at that to determine what students need, that, you know, intervention, those kind of things. And then, um, so yes, those happen. Um, they're happening three times a year with our common formative assessments. And then in the- smaller... Well, they happen more than that. So the local right. assessment plan happens three times a year, yeah, which is common right. across grade levels. And that is a published document that's on our website. Um, that's been there for a long time. We've tweaked it this year. So it's a little bit different this year than it has been in the past after feedback from teachers. Um, around it being a little bit too um, much <laughs> um, to alleviate some of it. But there's also the common formative assessment based on our priority standards. So those are the standards that we've chosen, for instance, in math for grade, I always go to grade two because I was a grade two teacher, math for grade two saying these are the ones that all students will have access to, all students, this is what we can tell a parent, we're guaranteeing these standards. Um, and so we have common formative assessments within a professional learning system or community of grade two teachers around those particular standards. But the teachers don't have common formative assessments for every standard because kids would be here until they were about 24 years old if it was every standard. So we've had to choose. Um, and and so the, that's where the priority standards line up. And when you hear the term common formative assessment, that means it's a priority standard and that all teachers have have know that te that standard needs to be taught. So um, where what a big switch has been for our teachers is that we're saying we're, we would never tell a teacher how to teach that priority standard. That's a teacher's expertise coming in. But we are saying you need to teach it that this time and you need to teach it at the same time as your colleagues are so that you can come together to look at the data and look at which kids really knocked it out of the park, which kids need more support. How are you going to divide up the kids so that kids get that more support? And that's the piece that's really tricky um, because it's timing and all that kind of stuff. And it's um, it's really important. So that's where we have more to grow um, just in terms of getting it right. Right. And so those calendars would be more grade-based based on the... Or content if we're talking about high school. Yep. So that's what they're... That tricky part is what they're saying is, is key. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, last question, the element five, um, one of the recommendations uh, is a family advisory committee. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've had listening sessions. Mm -hmm. um, are there other initiatives to more formalize? Like, I don't know if you would call it a, a family advisory committee, but but something beyond listening sessions. So the district, we have a district um, caregiver council yep. um, that has had very few people join, um, but that we originally had talked about do we do separate committees? And then we, again, it was like, okay, but all of our work needs to be together. And so that's the the um, venue that we're looking to do that. And we would certainly encourage more parents to join that. <clears throat> um, Kim or I don't know, Lynn made it. Doesn't look like it. No. Thank you. That was super helpful. Um, no, and and having this, these report backs and feedbacks are, are great and just echoing what Jill said, you have done quite a bit in I guess a little less than two years. Yeah. Uh, she did just sign a 15 year contract. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so um, I think we just have policy monitor and report uh, because we did the student representative piece earlier. Um, do I have a motion to approve C-12, Prevention of Sexual has Harassment as Prohibited by Title VI? Nine. Nine. Sorry, I had Title VI in my mind. Um, and it's been a long week, so my Roman numeral number reading has <laughs> slipped. Uh, um, motion to approve that? Move that we approve uh, the policy monitoring report. Do you have a second? Uh, any discussion, questions? 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Any opposed? We approve that. And now we need a motion to go into executive session for the purposes of appointing a uh, student rep for the was it 2025? 24, 25. 24, 25. It's 2025 would be a long span. <laughs> uh, um, for the 2024, 25 uh, school year. And they start earlier than that, don't they? they start, well, they come to the retreat. Uh, yeah. Whenever the board decides to, yeah. And we can invite people in, right? Like, yeah, we, we can. Yeah. They don't, yeah, they can, they can. They can start appearing. No, I'm saying to the executive session, right? So, do we want Miriam? Please ask the. Students. Yeah, we can definitely invite Miriam and Alara. And Alara to yeah. join. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes. I need to go into executive session to discuss the selection of student representative for. I'll second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Right. So let's march down the, the room. Alara, I just sent an email to you around just a Google Meet for executive session. It's just easier with the webinar. So if you look in your email, there should be a, an invite for you from me. Okay, thank you. I'll be in it in a second. <laughs> I'm not there right now. <laughs> 